Good morning, and welcome to the boardroom of the National Transportation Safety Board. I am Calvin Stafford, and it's my privilege to serve as the chairman of the NTSB. Today we meet in open session, as required by the Government in the Sunshine Act, to consider the accident involving a corporate jet owned and operated by the Revelation Creek Farm Group at Ann Arbor Municipal Airport, Ann Arbor, Michigan, on May 22, 2016. The accident airplane, a Cessna Citation XLS Plus, carrying two pilots, a flight attendant, and eight passengers, was landing on a wet runway following a thunderstorm when it overran the runway, went down an embankment, and came to rest in a ravine. Nine people lost their lives. On behalf of my fellow board members and the entire NTSB staff, I would like to offer our sincerest condolences to the family members and friends of all those who lost their lives. We recognize that this crash forever changed your lives and that nothing can replace the loss of your loved ones. But our hope is that this investigation will help us to prevent such tragedies in the future. As it is in any accident, it's a chain of events that lead to a tragic outcome. In a moment, you'll hear about the many actions taken by the flight crew, the flight attendant, and flight operations and maintenance personnel from the airplane's corporate owner. Please be mindful that there was no malice on the part of any of these individuals. Yet their actions or inactions all played a role in an outcome that none of them wanted. By discussing this report in an open forum today, we hope that the lessons learned as a result of this tragic accident will serve as an opportunity for corporate flight departments all over the country to take stock of their operations and to ensure that future accidents are prevented. Now I'd like to introduce the staff who investigated this accident and will be presenting the report today. Mr. Brett Rogers was the investigator in charge. Mr. Peyton Elway, served as the operations group chairman. Mr. Darrell Riggins was the human performance group chairman. And Mr. Kirk Griffin examined the safety management systems. Our IIC has the opening presentation. Thank you and good morning Chairman Stafford and members of the board. On May 22, 2016, about 1500 Eastern Daylight Time, a Cessna Citation XLS Plus, November 703 Juliet Delta, registered to the Revelation Creek Farm Group, LLC, crashed after, after it overran the end of the runway 24 while landing at Ann Arbor Municipal Airport, Ann Arbor, Michigan. The airplane rolled off the end of the paved overrun area down an embankment, across the grassy area, and came to stop in a ravine. The two pilots, a flight attendant, and six passengers died, and two passengers were seriously injured. The airplane was destroyed by impact forces in a post-crash fire. The corporate flight, which originated in Athens, Georgia, was conducted under the provisions of 14 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 91 as a corporate flight. An instrument flight rules flight plan was filed and daytime instrument meteorological conditions prevailed at the time of the accident. Prior to the departure, the captain obtained a weather briefing that included thunderstorms near Ann Arbor Airport about the time of the scheduled landing. The passengers decided to leave early in an attempt to arrive prior to the predicted storms. While airborne, the captain rechecked the weather and noted the gust front was progressing faster than expected. Rather than divert to another airport, the crew elected to enter a hold. Due to a low fuel state situation, the crew needed to land and hoped they were going to be on the back side of the storms. Following the storms, the wind shifted from an anticipated headwind, 
to a 12-knot tailwind. Due to the thunderstorms, the runway was wet and contaminated with water. During the landing, the airplane touched down 1,000 feet from the threshold of the 3,500-foot runway at a speed of 110 knots. The ground spoilers were deployed and max braking was applied within two seconds. The thrust reversers were not available due to being pinned by maintenance personnel. The airplane ran off the end of the runway and came to rest in a ravine about 1,000 feet from the end of the runway. A post-crash fire ensued. This image depicts the Ann Arbor Airport and runway 924, landing direction, touchdown, and max braking locations. The red line depicts the ground track after touchdown. Safety issues identified in this investigation include flight department culture regarding mission completion, tactical decision making regarding the weather at the destination airport, flight crew lack of familiarity with landing characteristics of new airplane, dispatch of flight with open minimum equipment list item, and personnel mismanage mismanagement of off-duty rest time. NTSB staff were assisted by party representatives from the FAA, Textron Aviation, the City of Ann Arbor Airport Division, and Rockwell Collins. An accredited representative from the Transportation Safety Board of Canada with the support from Pratt & Whitney Canada. This concludes my opening presentation and Mr. Elway will now discuss operational issues. Thank you and good morning Chairman Stafford and members of the board. The operational issues in this accident include the crew's experience in the airplane type, their decision making, and the airplane's landing performance. Both pilots were properly certified and qualified. However, this was the first flight in the airplane for both pilots. Both pilots had just finished initial type training and returned home only two days prior to the accident flight. Given their lack of experience in the actual airplane, the crew was likely unfamiliar with the landing characteristics of the citation. On the morning of the flight, the crew received a weather and performance package from their computer flight planning software. There's no terminal forecast for Ann Arbor, so the Ypsilanti Airport terminal forecast was used. National Weather Service forecasts indicated that thunderstorms were expected to impact the Ann Arbor area between 1330 and 1400 Eastern Daylight Time. There were no notams issued related to runway condition. The pilot informed the passengers of the, of the impending weather, and the passengers elected to depart earlier than their scheduled departure time in order to arrive in Ann Arbor before the weather. However, the passengers were slightly delayed to the airport, and the airplane departed at 1200 Eastern Daylight Time. The crew rechecked the weather en route and discovered that the line of thunderstorms was reaching Ann Arbor earlier than expected and had developed into a larger system. Rather than divert to another airport or return to Athens, the crew elected to hold until the storms passed. Between 1320 and 1445, about 1 1.5 inches of rain fell at the Ann Arbor airport, and a wind shift occurred to an easterly wind. The crew had been holding for about 40 minutes, and at 1420, the CVR recorded a conversation between the crew that they only had about 15 minutes of holding fuel left before they needed to make their approach, and that they quote unquote, hoped that they'd be on the backside of the storms. The crew exited the hold at 1430. There was no indication on the CVR that the crew obtained the latest weather information at the airport after the thunderstorm passage. Had they done so, they would have been alerted to a shift in winds which resulted in a 12 knot tailwind for runway 24. A new ATIS was issued for the Ann Arbor Airport at 1440 Eastern Daylight Time that did note the wind shift. 
The crew completed their initial landing performance calculations during their pre-flight planning. There was also no discussion in the CVR about recalculating landing performance numbers after holding. A written landing card was found in the cockpit wreckage that showed landing calculations for a dry runway approach to runway 24. The actual pre-flight landing performance calculations obtained by the NTSB investigators used forecasted weather and assumed a dry runway for landing. VREF speed for the approach was 109 knots, and a dry one-way landing calculations indicated a required landing distance of 2,606 feet. If the crew had factored a wet runway, the required landing distance increased to 3,505 feet, which is the same distance as the available landing distance at Ann Arbor. Staff used the approved landing performance charts to calculate the landing distance for the actual conditions at touchdown. Required landing distance with a dry runway and a 10 knot tailwind, which is the maximum that the landing distance charts calculate and also the maximum limitation for the airplane, was 3,277 feet. Calculations with a wet runway factor, which was present at the time of landing, show a required landing distance of 4,000 200 feet. Witness marks on the runway indicate that touchdown occurred at the 1,000 foot mark of the 3,505 foot long runway. Given the landing distance calculations, it was not possible for the crew to stop the airplane on the runway that remained following this touchdown. It is also likely that the crew could not have stopped the airplane on the runway had they landed within the touchdown zone in the conditions at the time of landing. Although the runway was contaminated with standing water, runway friction when the airplane, accident airplane landed would have been sufficient for stopping had the airplane landed into the wind and within the touchdown zone. This concludes my presentation. Dr. Riggins will now discuss human factors issues. Good morning. Prior to departure, the captain obtained a weather briefing that included thunderstorms near Ann Arbor Airport about the time of the scheduled landing. The crew decided to leave early in an attempt to arrive prior to the predicted storms. While airborne, the captain rechecked the weather and noted that the storms would arrive sooner than expected, so he elected to enter a hold in order to wait out the storms. Eventually, a low fuel state forced the crew to land. Their approach was rushed and they did not obtain an updated weather report that included heavy rainfall at the airport. When they broke out of the clouds, they were surprised to see a large amount of standing water on the runway. The crew briefly discussed the possibility of a go around for a better assessment of the runway's suitability for landing, but the captain decided to continue the approach. In the flare, the, cap the airplane floated due to an unexpected tailwind and the crew struggled to get the airplane to the ground. During the landing rollout, braking action was poor. These elements created high situational stress for the flight crew, which narrowed their attention and limited their consideration of alternative courses of action. The captain had been experiencing family issues as he had filed for divorce two months earlier. He had frequently complained to family and friends about having trouble sleeping as a result of related stress. About a week before the accident, he told his parents that he wanted to seek counseling from Revelation Creek Farms Employee Assistance Program, but he was afraid that the chief pilot would find out and terminate his employment. On the morning of the accident, he told his mother that he was exhausted and felt he had no business flying that day. His mother pleaded with him to call in sick, but he said that this was the first flight in a new airplane and he felt he had to go. Staff identified an issue with the first officer's management of off-duty rest. The day before the accident, the first officer had a day off, having just returned from three weeks of training. Although she did not start work until eight o'clock on the day of the accident, electronic evidence indicates that she used her personal computer for non-work activities from 11 p.m. until 3.30 a.m. the night before the accident. This permitted, at best, only three and a half hours of rest the night before the accident, which likely res resulted in significant fatigue. 
Colleagues reported that both pilots had previously demonstrated good judgment. During the accident landing, however, they proceeded with a landing even after the airplane had floated 25% of the way down the runway before touchdown and a go-around was cl clearly warranted. Evidence indicates that both pilots were fatigued and fatigue can lead to perseveration and reduced consideration of decision alternatives. Fatigue, in addition to situational stress, likely degraded the crew's decision-making and contributed to their inappropriate continuation of the landing. This concludes my presentation. Mr. Griffin will now discuss SMS and change management. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Stafford and members of the board. While safety management systems are not regulatory in nature for corporate operations, presently they are for 121 commercial air carriers, operators that have established SMS principles that are both documented and practiced, as well as formally being recognized by international SMS audit organizations, can therefore be scrutinized and evaluated per an accident investigation. SMS and culture is just as important as training, qualifications, and engineering. We will highlight Revolution Creek Farm Group LLC's safety management system, their policy and culture, and their change management process regarding the acquisition of aircraft, crew experience, and regulatory compliance. The company's formal and documented safety program is based on the four components of the safety management system safety policy, safety promotion, risk management, specifically change management, which is a major facet of this component, and safety assurance. All of these components, combined with the thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes of the employees, creates the safety culture. With the company expansion, combined with the acquisition of new financial obligations, the addition of the citation was perceived as paramount to the success of the organization. The ability of the airplane to fly above the weather would be a distinct advantage over the King Air, and it would limit delays and cancellations. The meeting in Ann Arbor would set a new direction for the company, and it was seen as vital and, quote, a can't-miss opportunity. It was perceived as critical to the future of the company, and everybody was made aware of that. So, when the familiarization training could not be scheduled in time, and the change of plans to have the meeting in Ann Arbor, no one raised a concern for fear of jeopardizing the future. From a cultural perspective, the perception that the company was, quote, riding on the pilots put undue operational pressure on the pilots to complete the mission. While no overt threat or direct intimidation was made, these various statements go against a just culture of safety and puts undue operational pressure on employees. The chief pilot, who is a key decision maker in the SMS, has operational authority to stop an operation, reassess, educate, and redevelop the process. He is an advocate for the pilots, and it is his job to educate the director of operations and the chief operating officer, who in turn have the responsibility to adhere to the safety policy and support the actions of flight operations. The SMS policy statement states that the chief operating officer is the accountable executive for the SMS program, and that the chief pilot Director of Maintenance and Safety Manager all have operational authority to cease and or modify an operation if they determine that a safety issue exists or that it imposes an increased risk. In addition, all employees have a responsibility to stop an operation without fear of reprisal or personal attack. A change management process should identify changes within the organization which may affect established processes, procedures, products, and services. Prior to that change, it quite simply asked this, what is the new airplane system process going to do to us? How will it affect us? What do we need to do to address any unforeseen issues? And what are the unintended consequences of adding this new airplane or system? With the implementation of the citation, the company is essentially adding a brand new and highly complex system that affects the organization on a holistic level. It affects flight operations, maintenance, customer service, training, general familiarization, and the company business model as a whole. The decision to add this system without doing a comprehensive assessment of all these aspects and how they each interact with each other increases the risk of an unseen hazard potential. While this process can be fluid and change, operational pressures, as a matter of best practice, should never be interfered with. The company SMS, which details the change management process as a major component of risk management, had gone untested. 
While the change management process was well documented, it was not practiced, due in part that major company changes of both an engineering and a procedural standpoint had never been accomplished or tested in a real world scenario in the past. Individual departments had operational meetings amongst themselves with little intra-department discussion on how the new aircraft would fit safely into an operation that had only known turboprops in the environment in which they flew. The addition of the citation was the first major system implemented at the operator. The employees directly responsible for carrying out the analysis were not familiar with the process because quite simply, it was never accomplished before. It was merely documented. The crews received their type ratings for the citation only days before the accident. The citation was onboarded with the company quickly and the flight department had not been able to complete a change management risk assessment, nor were they familiar with the documented process, which would have addressed the qualified but unexperienced crew members and the differences in performance between the two aircraft. The flight department maintenance and training did not identify and mitigate some of these key changes in the operation following the acquisition notably crew training, airplane performance, MEL changes, and overall philosophy. These items should have been asked before the formal addition of the airplane and long before the flight was accomplished. The change management process is structured and formal. In the short term, however, a leadership team with a belief in their SMS would see the issue, i.e. flight operations should see the potential safety conflict and know that in a perfect world, with perfect weather, well-trained crews, and an optimum airplane, the risk is minimal. In this case, however, by the time the meeting was planned and the flight was in the preparation stages, the risk factors were piling up. Even though the change management process was passed at this point, a risk assessment of the proposed flight would have highlighted these areas and mitigations could have taken place that would have alleviated or reduced the risk to an acceptable level. The flight was dispatched with the airplane's thrust reversers inoperative under the MEL. While the performance calculations for landing do not factor thrust reverser usage, there is a small performance edge with their use. The flight crew may not have been fully aware of any implications of the, in, of the inoperative thrust reverser. The crew also dispatched the airplane thinking that they were going to have a dry runway. If the change management or risk management process had been accomplished, the risk of making the flight could have been mitigated. However, the root of this is the culture that allowed the airplane to be dispatched in the first place. Flight attendants and the passengers had a lack of familiarity with the design of the new airplane, had years of experience on the King Air's emergency procedures, but virtually no knowledge of the Cessna system's emergency procedures or emergency door egress procedures. In fact, this was the first time any of the non-flight crew passengers had even been on the airplane compared with the dozens of flights on the King Air. In the confusion of the accident, emergency egress was hampered by a lack of familiarity and experience. Four of the fatally injured passengers were found huddled in the aft part of the cabin near the lavatory seat, which is where the King Air door would have been located. The differences in the operations of the two distinct aircraft is profound, and during an emergency, there is little time to troubleshoot or guess as to how the doors open or where the doors are located. A change management process would have identified these differences. The training department and in-flight did not accomplish this in a, in a formal and systemic way. Even with the quick addition of the Cessna, a change management timeline would have contained a familiarization component and no business operations should have taken place until such a time that all of the CM components were completed. Familiarization requires few resources, little time, and few mitigations, but greatly improves survivability. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our presentation. Thank you to the staff for those excellent and insightful presentations. I would now like to read the draft findings. The flight crew was properly certificated and qualified in accordance with federal regulations and company requirements. There was no evidence of any pre-impact structural, engine, or systems failures. Prior to takeoff, the pilots had the pertinent weather, airport, and airplane information necessary to make a safe landing at Ann Arbor. However, they failed to get the latest weather information, which indicated that the wind direction had shifted and that standing water was present. The circumstances associated with the landing, including the crew's first landing at this airport, 
the standing water on the runway, and the unexpected tailwind component likely exacerbated the situational stress during the landing. Based on the reduced friction due to the standing water and the touchdown occurring with only 75% of the runway remaining and a 12-knot tailwind, it was not possible to stop the airplane on the runway. The pilots would have been able to stop the airplane if they had landed into the wind within the touchdown zone and maintained directional, maximum directional braking during the landing. Due to the two-week delay in scheduling the airplane familiarization training for the flight attendant and passengers, they were not adequately familiar with the operation of the emergency exits. The first officer poorly managed her off-duty time by not acquiring sleep and therefore was fatigued due to sleep loss. The captain did not adhere to the company fatigue policy. He could have called in fatigued for the accident flight if he were not fit for duty and been immediately removed from duty until he felt fit to fly again. The airplane thrust reversers had been pinned and placarded inoperative per the airplane minimum equipment list. However, the flight crew may not have been aware of the stopping performance advantage that was lost due to this condition. Board members, is there any discussion on these draft findings? Seeing none, can I have a motion to adopt? So moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All five ayes, the findings have been adopted. I'll now read the draft probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's failure to execute a go-around after overflying the first portion of the runway without touching down. Contributing to the accident were, one, the crew's failure to recognize a wind shift and standing water on the runway and to recalculate landing performance numbers. Two, lack of company training on tailwind landing limits of their new airplane. Three, dispatching the airplane with an open MEL item that had the potential to adversely affect flight safety. And four, the captain's fatigue, which affected his ability to effectively plan for and monitor the approach and landing. Contributing to the severity of the accident, was the delay in a planned training exercise to familiarize the flight attendant and prospective passengers with the operation of the emergency exits. Board members, is there any discussion on the draft probable cause? Hearing none, can I have a motion to adopt and second? All those in favor of the draft probable cause signify by a hand and aye. Aye. All five ayes. The probable cause has been adopted. In closing, I'd like to recognize the hard work of the NTSB staff in conducting this investigation and producing this report. It's striking how many of our findings today related to decisions made by many different people, from pilots to mechanics to flight department managers and corporate executives. No one decision on its own caused this outcome. Rather, they each played a role in the accident chain. If each of you involved in business aviation pause just a moment to think about the safety decision implications of each decision that you're a part of, future business aviation accidents will be prevented because the accident chains will be broken. Thank you, and we stand adjourned.